So good afternoon, everybody in Ethiopia, and uh, good morning for those of you here in the U.S. So here is um, um, a um, a uh, presentation again by one of our uh, co-hosts. Uh, that's uh, um, Elias Ashami. He doesn't need any more introduction, as you know, he has presented three times in the past, so or two times in the past. So he um, is well known to all of you. Uh, just briefly. He is um, uh, a graduate from Gondor. Uh, he has um, uh, certificates and board certificates actually in internal medicine, infectious diseases, and uh, critical care uh, here from the US. He works uh, primarily as a critical care physician now. Uh, he also uh, works in the ICU uh, where he has taken care of COVID-19 patients. This is a topic that was um, kind of uh, asked to, uh, to be presented by some of you. Uh, and uh, Dr. Elias is going to probably give us an overview, but focus a little bit more on uh, ARDS. And uh, again, um, Elias, thank you for uh, doing this. And please, the floor is yours. OK, thank you, Gurma. Hello, everyone. Um, so t today, I think um, we're going to talk about just the, the general ICU topic, and uh, we try to relate it to uh, the current pandemic, COVID. And I will mainly touch on a, a general principle of shock um, and other complications, uh, other than respiratory failure, since respiratory failure is dealt with uh, uh, very well by uh, uh, Dr. Mullah, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Rahel, started with the introduction, and the uh, mechanical ventilation was was presented by Dr. Zayun. So, so I will focus more on the um, um, multi-organ failure, mainly on shock, AKI, and uh, and touch a little bit on super infections and uh, and other complications. Next slide, please. So this is one of our patients we saw, a 35-year-old male, a nurse at one of the floor in my hospital. He was diagnosed actually as our patient on March 23rd. Uh, and uh, so he was quarantined at home uh, because his presentation was very mild. But on the 2nd of April, he presented to, to our ED um, with a worsening hypoxia. And uh, I don't know whether you can see the, the x-ray was, that, that chest x-ray was his x-ray actually, his, his presentation, as you can see, there are bilateral, more of patchy and filtrate. And his oxygen requirement was about two and three liters. Um, so, uh, so he was presented under uh, the, the, the internist service actually, because he, his presentation was not really cr critical, but then uh, as a routine, uh, EKG was obtained before they started on hydroxychloroquine. And the, the EKG at the bottom, as you can see, uh, that was his first EKG. Mm -hmm. He did not have any chest complaints at all, other than shortness of breath and little tightness, but no left chest pain. Um, and, as you can, and he has no past medical history. Again, he's a 35-year-old male, uh, married and has one kid. And um, his troponin was normal. So as you can see, that, that uh, has a, what looks like left bundle branch block pattern. Uh, and that's when we ICU was asked to see him, along with cardiology. Um, so his 2D echo, uh, the same night did show left ventricular ejection fraction reduced about 40, 45 uh, percent, uh, with no uh, no uh, akinesia or hypokinesia. It's just general global uh, reduction in ejection fraction. Now, this is a, just a segue to uh, the complications. I don't have any intention to talk about cardiac complication detail since that is a topic for presentation for tomorrow. Next slide, please. So cardiac injuries are uh, common, reported uh, about seven, anywhere ranging from seven to 
in COVID patients. And uh, that, that usually correlates with the shock that tend to be their primary reason, although hypovolemic shock as well as septic shock are, are as well common. And unfortunately, uh, other than respiratory failure, majority of them die of uh, complication of shock. Uh, this is one of the studies that came out of one as, as high as 40 percent end up dying of shock, uh, at least part in, due to fulminant myocarditis. And um, so it's a highly variable. I'll show you to, uh, some tables later on. And especially in hospitalist patients, uh, uh, it could be high as I had 35% in ICU. And some of the risk factors are the same risk factors uh, that complicates COVID in general, older age, uh, especially comorbidities such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and hypertension. Now, some of the markers tend to correlate uh, with a high risk of cardiac injury include a high D-dimer and lower lymphocyte count. What, so I'm going to talk about shock a little bit the next five, six slides. I'll take you back to your physiology class just briefly. So stay with me. I'm trying to make it a little more interesting. But, uh, but the reason I, I, I chose this for as part of the discussion today is because this is a common ICU manifestation. And so it's in any, any disease, um, it usually end up in shock and lead to deaths, including COVID-19. So we're seeing a lot of patients uh, uh, in shock. And like I said, that's, that's their pathway to death usually. So in general definition of shock, as you remember, is a, is a m m supply demand mismatch of uh, oxygen. So uh, it's an adequate oxygen delivery to meet your need and that result in global tissue hyperperfusion and result in metabolic acidosis. So your body, what it does is, so to maintain the response, it activates these two common pathways, right? The first one is called sympathetic nervous system with the release of uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, and cortisol. Uh, that what we're trying to do is by causing vasoconstriction and increasing the heart rate, and contractility to, and, and that results in cardiac output to try to uh, increase the perfusions. And at the same time, what you try to retain water and sodium by activating the renin angiotensin axis. That also has some vasoconstriction effect. In general, this too will increase your blood volume and blood pressure. At the cellular level, to lack of oxygen, uh, there will be a lot of ATP depletion that will lead to ion pump dysfunction and cellular edema that will release uh, hydrolysis and lead to cell death. And uh, so, but your body in general, what it does to you, the main purpose of your body in a uh, state of shock is to uh, serve the, those two important organs, right? Your brain and your heart. Uh, everything else comes next. So, so the goal is to maintain cerebral and cardiac perfusion. That it does that by taking the blood away from the rest of them, right? It causes vasoconstriction of your splat, splenchinic, and musculoskeletal and renal blood flow. And unfortunately, that leads to um, lactic acidosis, especially from your gut, and eventually overcomes the body's compensa compensatory mechanisms. So now, and that's uh, how it leads to um, multi-organ pain. Uh, so, and this global tissue hypoxia at, at tissue level will will disrupt your endothelial by a lot of inflammation, and you, uh, so your body is not able to deliver oxygen, and of course that leads to lactic acidosis. Like I said, and that lactic acidosis, as you know, will suppress your cardiac function even more. Uh, so that cardiovascular insufficiency will lead more shock, and it's just a vicious cycle. So this progression of the shock leads to multi-organ failure, right? So cardiac depression, like I said, and lead to respiratory distress because you, look at that lactic acidosis. Uh, your body is trying to get rid of CO2 as well. I try to comp 
prostate and uh, renal uh, failure because of the either endotoxin releases, the actual vasoconstriction, low blood flow, and also uh, DIC. And that would we call what we call in organ failure. So in the general approach to patient in shock, right, the ABCs, you, you, you try to support the cardiorespiratory system, and you have to have continuous monitor, including pulse oxy, and you give them oxygen, obviously, you need to have a good IV access, and get your labs, and if, if, you, if you can, blood gas, and uh, it's very important to have a, a adequate uh, I, uh, ins and outs monitoring and foley catheter will be very important and you have to have a frequent vital sign and of course your physical examination you focus on um, the, the other than the vital signs your mental status the skin color right the temperature and pulse extra and try to find if there's an infectious source and you get basic labs including lactic lactic lactate level coagulation studies and blood gas at the same. So, and, and you can do further evaluation depending on your finding. Either to find the source, you might have to do lumbar punctures, get your blood cultures, or if you're thinking of other cause of uh, uh, shock, either trauma or even ischemic colitis. So you might want to get more imaging such as ultrasound, abdominal and pelvic CT scans. Cortisol level, we usually don't obtain cortisol level, but some do. Uh, uh, you can assume there's relative adrenal insufficiency and, and uh, go ahead and start treating, or you can get your level if you are interested. And, uh, and, and try to cover other complications. You might have to obtain fibronigen, D-dimer. D-dimer is that might give you another clue whether this is has to do, your shock has to do with any a, a massive pulmonary embolism, for example, that could be cause of uh, shock as well, or it could be complications as well. So, so your histories should be thorough and your physical examinations as well, right? Some of the things that I pointed is uh, there and some others, for example, if you have JVD um, and, and some evidence of um, um, either valvular, um, uh, diseases and that might lead to more to cardiac causes, right? And uh, and you have to listen to your lung sounds because you know pneumothorax is another cause. Uh, make sure that you know that's not the reason. And and as as, as well as you know severe cardiomyopathy with cardi cardiogenic shock might lead to pulmonary edema. I might give you a clue. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, renal urine output is crucial. Uh, so. These are, you know, these are very common, especially for your nursing staff to the early detection of uh, your patients in shock, right? You know, the one, sometimes one of the first signs could be you alter mental status, right? So, so you know, and sometimes these are very non-specific, generally sick looking patients. Sometimes alter mental status with, uh, with uh, confusion their skin is like cool, cool and some, it could be model, model could be a little change uh, or it could be hot and flush. They are high output failure, right, early on. And of course your pulses might give you a clue and, uh, and, and the uh, definition of shock by diagnosis is if you have mean arterial pressure less than 65, sometimes you can, you can use your systolic blood pressure and ticardia could come first too. So these are all signs and symptoms of shock that you need to keep an eye on. Uh, so these are just, uh, you know, basic uh, early signs. Next one, please. One more click. So sometimes you can uh, just roughly estimate you what your blood pressure is just by feeling the pulses, right? If you can feel the dorsal spedis, your systolic is at least 90. So, you know, it's, uh, you can just, just estimate, this is just basic. So move on to the next one, please. Uh, so goals of treatment, right? Your A, B, C, D, E. Yeah, airway, you got to control breathing. I will talk about each of them in the 
next few slides. You gotta optimize circulation and oxygen delivery. And you have to achieve and know how to, how you achieved your end points of resuscitation. Next. So airway, right? So what you have to make sure that if your patient needs to be intubated or not, because now intubation uh, is, is the most riskier uh, procedures you would do in a patient in shock, right? Yeah. So immediately, you gotta make sure that the blood pressure is adequate for you to even think about intubation because you might end up killing. This happens a lot even here because if, you, if your patient has a significant uh, hypotension and um, you decide to go out and put the tube in and uh, the next thing you know is your patient is in cardiac arrest. So a lot, a lot of reasons, right? What you do is you, when you intubate someone, you're creating this positive pressure and that uh, immediately will decrease preload and uh, the patient's already in shock and you're just leading them to, to sudden cardiac arrest. Another one is you have to use sedatives usually to intubate them. That uh, lower blood pressure in general. So th because of those two reasons, you have to make sure that you uh, adequately resuscitate patient before you intubate them. This will be true in taking care of your COVID patients too, because remember your COVID patients, as we mentioned in the prior presentations, they have a fever, tachycardia, tachypnea. So they have high metabolic uh, demand. So they, they are actually, when they present to you, they could have diarrhea. They could be intravascularly dry. So, and so, um, and without adequate resuscitation, if you, and because of respiratory distress, uh, if you intubate them, they might lead to cardiac arrest. So you have to keep this in mind. In, in general, in any patient in particular, uh, relating to this discussion in COVID. Next. And the next one is uh, breathing. So now once you put the tube in, put them on mechanical ventilation, it actually helps you and taking away that demand, right? Because you remember your respiratory muscles consume significant amount of oxygen. So, so you, and uh, sometimes as high as one third of your all demand taken by respiratory muscles. So when you put the tube in, take away their, their breathing. And so now the mechanical ventilation is doing the job. So respiratory muscle doesn't have to work. So you're taking that demand. So you're helping with the shock situation. And of course, the kipnea contribute to lactic acidosis. So now you're lowering that as well. And you have to sedate your patient, right? So when you sedate, you do two things. Number one, taking the, again, the, the respiratory muscles away. And also your brain is now uh, less active, so, right? You, the, your brain does not have to consume as much um, oxygen as before. So, so you're taking more demand away. So it helps you. Uh, in a lot of ways to take away the demand. And and also, um, which I didn't mention this one is, um, so as the, when you create the positive pressure, actually th that does help you in decreasing afterload, increasing uh, in general cardiac output. I think we, we can discuss this at some other topics, but uh, uh, immediately it will reduce your preload, but in general, uh, the, the, the positive pressure will help you in decreasing afterload and, uh, and improving your cardiac output as well. So, so optim the C is circulation. So here is uh, uh, mainly fluid. So um, in general, in any shock, uh, uh, buffered um, crystalloids, what we call them is isotonic crystalloids or any buffer solution, including ring of lactate, are the preferred uh, fluid for resuscitation. And uh, you can uh, target them to uh, your mean arterial pressure, if you want, or which is mainly that what we use. And sometimes, if you have access to it, you can use central uh, venous pressure, which is a passive way of monitoring. Uh, that might be misleading, but it, it gives you some idea about your preload. Of course, urine output will be important. This is what we usually call at least about 0 0.5 ml per kg per hour. Uh, uh, but, uh, but just keep in mind that 
uh, if you have a AKI due to ATN or a pre-renal, uh, uh, you might not be able to get this urine output despite your adequate resuscitation. Yes. So, uh, uh, but that's what we try to achieve. Of course, you see your heart rate improving. And uh, this is just to mention that there's no outcome benefit from using college. So you should focus on uh, your uh, crystalloid. Next. <clears throat> so oxygen delivery. So um, number one, you, you, uh, you, you do the, which is the straight forward thing is deliver oxygen. Give them supplemental oxygen through either nasal cannula oxygen or through the mask or through mechanical ventilation. And you decrease the oxygen demand as we spoke earlier. And, and some of your analgesia, anxiolytics can help in that as well. But the other thing is if you remember your ca cardiac delivery depends on three factors, right? Your cardiac output is the most important one. Your oxygen saturation is the other one and another factors in that uh, calculation is your hemoglobin. But for oxygen delivery, these three are the most important. So, so now having said that, you don't have to uh, transfuse them to, to get them as high as 10 that we used to do years ago. But at least you have to have adequate amount of hemoglobin to deliver oxygen. Just keep that in mind, especially in acute uh, uh, bleeding uh, and sometimes in septic shock as well. We, we usually hear there's what we call it a uh, uh, restrict transfusion. So we don't usually aim above seven un un unless there are special patients, uh, unless you have active MI. Uh, so, but you, you gotta make sure that hemoglobin is adequate because you need that for delivery as well. And we do follow serial lactate levels. Uh, we don't usually do central venous oxygen saturation unless we have pulmonary catheter placed for some other reason. We don't do that any longer. We used to place what we call swan guns uh, pretty much on every ICU patient years ago, but that's no uh, no more the practice. But uh, if you do have access to that, that's another way of knowing yeah, you have adequate amount of oxygen delivery. But serum lactate levels will help you. This graph just to show you how lactate level correlate with in-house in, in uh, mortality. Uh, that just tell you the, the severity of the disease. Uh, so, so that's one of the ways we monitor is we get, we make sure that lactic level is back to normal. Uh, but there are a lot of reasons. I just have to mention this before I move to the next one. There are a lot of other reasons, as you know, for lactic acidosis other than shock. So just keep in that mind uh, what we call them type B lactic acidosis. Um, the main one we see, we encounter is here, chronic liver diseases um, and or, or local ischemias, Don't, like uh, gut ischemia, for example, can just give you significant lactic acid, so you need to keep that in mind as well. Next. So endpoints of resuscitation is um, the whole goal is to maximize survival and minimize morbidity. And that's very important. So uh, that's why you want to get to a certain level. So uh, these are the goal, as I mentioned earlier, you are now put above 0 0.5 ml per kg per hour, uh, central venous pressure, target at least eight to 12. And your mean arterial pressure is the main point, above 65 millimeter mercury. Now, if you other numbers are better, like your alter, your mental status back the baseline, you are out, you are now put is adequate. Uh, uh, then you might settle for systolic blood pressure rather than mean arterial pressure, because mean arterial pressure for a different reason might not get to 65. Uh, uh, so sometimes we do settle for systolic blood pressure, um, you name it 90, 100, depending on the patient's condition, prior blood pressure pattern. Uh, if you do have access to central venous oxygen concentration, obviously above either 65 to 70 percent will be uh, 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 your end of resuscitation. Now, if you have persistent hypotension, uh, you need to think about other causes of shock, right? 
either your volume resuscitation was not adequate. So you need to revisit that because sometimes people, especially with profuse diarrhea, you might have to cut, continue to uh, chase that diarrhea or, uh, uh, or significant polyuria for one or another reason. So, uh, uh, or they might be, they have been dry like a bone and then you just, uh, you don't know how long they've been uh, dry. So you might have to give them more than your 30 cc per kg uh, uh, volume resuscitation. So you just have to keep in mind and you need to have some, some way of monitoring that. And another one is pneumothorax, right? So uh, that's why your physical examination and your x-rays will be important. Sometimes you, can, you might be able to use bedside ultrasound to give you an idea as well. And of course, cardiac tamponade. Um, and some, they might have hidden bleeding, like RP bleed, for example. Retroperitoneal bleed is common complications. And of course, a relative adrenal insufficiency. So, so that is very common. So, uh, so you need to keep this other reasons for hypotension if you, your resuscitation does not result in uh, 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 improvement in blood pressure. So practically speaking, for you, you especially for your ICU nurses, you and for you too, this is not a type of patient like you admit in the morning and come back to around the next. So this, this they need uh, frequent vital signs and uh, you have to monitor your success of therapies um, and watch for any decompensation. And you have to let your nurses know that these are very sick people. Uh, they, so that's why they need to be in the unit. So this is just to mention, I'm not, I have no plan to, dis to discuss about the types of show. It might be topic for another day, but uh, uh, just to give you uh, just remind you about the types of shock in hypovolemia, of course, what we could normally call a distributive include the septic and anaphylactic and neurogenic and that distributive ones. And of course, obstructives are include the pul your pulmonary embolism, your cardiac tamponades, you know, your pneumothorax, and of course, the main one called cardiogenic shock. All right. So, the, in COVID, the, the strategies are the same. Um, there's n nothing in particular we do uh, uh, in COVID-19 pneumonia patients when they have shock. But the only thing you need to keep in mind is uh, you, your fluid management in this patient and as any ARDS patient should be very conservative. Uh, well, what you don't want to do is worsening and respiratory decompensation. So they, so they might have also this, remember myocardial involvement, so you need to keep in mind that, like the patient I started with, uh, if you remember his EF was already down. And so the, some of the things you can do is you can monitor his troponin or BNP and also echocardiogram, either bedside echo or official echocardiogram. And, and this patient, what we do is usually we start use early use of vasopressors and inotropes uh, rather than continue fluid resuscitation. Uh, and, uh, and fluid of choice, the same as uh, other shocks are buffered or balanced crystalloids. Uh, and uh, the first line of uh, vasopressors are um, um, just like any shock, essentially, is norepinephrine. Now, if you don't have norepinephrine, you can use dopamine, they, although there's no uh, significant, this is a weak recommendation. Um, and uh, vasopressin has always been the second uh, line choice uh, for essentially any shock other than cardiogenic, maybe. And your target maps is, should be between, anywhere between 16 and 65. Like I said, sometimes you might have to opt uh, to use a systolic for one or another reasons. When you have refractory shock, after you rule out the other causes of shock, um, uh, you, uh, you might use low-dose corticosteroid therapy. Because remember, uh, adrenal insufficiency is very common, relative adrenal insufficiency. What we usually use recommended doses like 200 milligram in a, either you can 
divided into twice or three times a day. Um, and we, so that's after you, the so normally you start with one presser and another one, but by then you have to think about, it is about time to think about related about data insufficiency or not. Uh, there's no, I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, controversies about using corticosteroid, whether they have any benefit, especially if you remember in this COVID-19, the role of steroids is not clear, right? So I just keep that in mind, but uh, uh, we, might, we, we might use this. We do. So, and so the next, my next discussion is gonna be AKI. As you can see from this particular study, uh, um, kidney injury was significant. It, they were about in ICU admission, about 29% of them did have AKI. That will be my topic for the next one. Next slide. So this is uh, one of my other patients, uh, 56 year old female. Uh, she had past medication of breast cancer. So I admitted her on March 30, uh, uh, twice year after she presented with fever, shortness of breast and diarrhea. She had chemo, I think the last chemotherapy two weeks prior to her presentation. And, um, and the next day she went into severe respiratory distress. And so we decided to put her on mechanical ventilation. She was intubated. And this, I don't, I, I know this graph is not clear to you, but just to show you her, the graph of her creatinine, uh, I think at day, by, by day three, um, it's picked up to 5.9, uh, uh, one and, and less than one is the normal here. So, um, so she obviously developed a acute kidney injury. Um, she was started on a continuous renal re replacement therapy on the fours. So this is common. And in one of the studies in Huan, uh, the one I show you, AKI was as high as 25 to 29% in ICU patients. Uh, so that's why it's very important to have your volume status optimization. And this patients, you know, when they presented, uh, they could be dry. So you, so your volume resuscitation uh, has to be targeted to that, especially in her, for example, she had diarrhea, other than of course fever, which is high metabolic state and to keep near respiratory failure. Uh, so your volume status uh, optimization is very crucial. And, the, and, uh, so, and of course, in any renal failure, you need to exclude other causes uh, of uh, injury, including drugs, avoid nephrotoxic drugs, make sure there's no obstruction. So um, the ultrasound will be important because post renal is also a common cause. And uh, you also have to avoid hyper resuscitation. That uh, hypervolemia not only worsening your respiratory status, it could actually lead to worsening of renal failure. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to be quicker here. So this is just some of the mechanism of acute kidney injury. Uh, so, um, so because remember this, this state has cytokine release syndrome. Um, so that can have direct cyt cytotoxic effect to the kidney. Uh, uh, and the other one is by causing other, what they call organ cross talkers. If you have cardio, cardiomyopathy with viral myocarditis can lead to cardiorenal syndrome. If you, you know, alveolar damage with acidosis can lead to renal medullary hypoxia and, and uh, rhabdomyolysis can lead to tubular toxicity. And, uh, and on and on, endotoxin as well, septic AKI. So I'm gonna move on. I know I'm running out of time. So, so the indication for renal person therapy is the same as any AKI remain the same. And CRRT, we do prefer in ICU for obvious reasons because this patient has hemodynamic instability. So we wanna have slow, continuous removal. Um, and I know there was a lot of controversy on ACE inhibitors and use of angiotensin receptor blockers. So do you know there's no data not to use them? Because that get the, the thought was that using S inhibitors can upregulate the receptors, which the COVID-19 use uh, to infect cells, but there's no data. So we continue 
unless there is other reason to stop them. Uh, and uh, move on. So other complications are, um, uh, as yesterday and the day before, I think Dr. Fitzum also mentioned, I remember your DVT prophylaxis. In this patient, they have multiple uh, uh, micro thrombies and it's essentially hypercoagulable state. This is one of uh, this patient, the particular same patient is a 46 year old, our D dimer, if you see your D dimer, it was as high as 4.2 on day, on, on day 10. Uh, so use of a, a low molecular heparin, it's preferred one, unless you have contraindication. Some people use uh, aggressive prophylaxis either by combining mechanical device as well as pharmacology, even higher dose of whether you should use therapeutic anticoagulation, that's very controversial. Um, even in my facility, some physicians do it, but there's no data on that. But you just have to keep in that it's very common venous thromboembolism and you need to focus on prophylax. Next. And this is the same patient, which unfortunately ended up developing thrombocytopenia. This is just a graph for the platelet. When she presented, it was like 130, I think, 140. Remember, she had chemo as well two weeks prior, but she eventually, her platelet went up to 10,000. And uh, so we had to transfuse her actually prior to procedures. And uh, so, like I said, they are very limited data, they have, but we know they have high risk of VT in this population uh, due to underlying COVID as well as other critical illnesses, because these are older gentlemen who have multiple comorbidities as well. Um, and uh, as uh, Dr. Fitzum yesterday mentioned, so there are evidence of microvascular thrombosis. Too. And this is just one of the study, the case series in Chinese study where they have the dimer elevation more than six times. Um, and that has some uh, prog prognosis value as well because people who have high dimer tend to not to do good. I would uh, favor route. This unfortunately the same patient CT scan, as you can see, she ended up developing stroke, uh, ischemic stroke. This is her scan. Uh, you, you can see in the temporal on the right side and parietal and as well as occipital region. Uh, and uh, and again, uh, the, the, they have higher uh, thrombosis risk as well as their underlying conditions, even her breast cancer, remember she has breast cancer, so that put a higher risk as well. So, but but uh, in one of the studies out of one, about 36% of them have some kind of neurological symptom and about 5.9% 5, 5, 5 were with complicated by stroke. So this is one of our experience. We actually have two patients with similar presentation. Um, you know, when, when we're trying to wake them up, they were not waking up. So we had to do further investigation, find out that two of them had a stroke. Uh, like this one. So of course, super infection. Super infections are common. This is a, a 69 year old, uh, case three, who had an underlying cerebral palsy. He was admitted to the hospital on the fifth with the COVID-19 pneumonia. Uh, as you can see, he went on to develop staph aureus out of his blood as well as respiratory. And that's just his presentation CT scan, actually. Uh, and uh, so super infections are very common. Um, and he, he ended up in septic shock and multi organ failure. Uh, so he's still with us. So next, next part. Um, so, it, so super infections are common. Just keep in mind that. And a lot of people will start empiric antimicrobials. Uh, uh, from the get go, but it's not recommended. So, but if you have reason, obviously, it's hard sometimes to differentiate between the COVID-19 pneumonia and bacterial pneumonia. So most of them end up on some kind of antibiotics. Uh, uh, but uh, in this particular series, you know, you can see uh, 10 to 20% of them would have some kind of infection. Um, next, please. Uh, and then this, but if super infections are usually highly resistant. Fortunately, ours was uh, um, methicillin sensitive staph aureus, but uh, you know, KPC producing um, 
all clubs here learn pneumonias in ESPLs and pseudomonas are very common. Even there are reports of aspergillus infections and some candida infections as well. So, uh, and the, so this is just one of the patients that we, I just want to show you in your monitoring, remind you that these are what we use, C-reactive and ferritin. This is the same patient. Uh, so C-reactive protein is signi was significantly high on day three of admission and, uh, and the ferritin as well was significantly high. So, so that will tell you the progression of the disease. Um, so you need that, that you can use it as part of your monitoring. I think that's the, my last slide. Thank you, um, Dr. Elias. I am going to stop sharing here in a minute and there's a lot of questions. And uh, uh, what I want to do is maybe um, you can, uh, as I sort through the questions, uh, you can maybe answer a couple of um, my questions. You know, one is about monitoring and, and I know, you know, all the swan gans catheters and, um, uh, you know, what nuts are really not being used very often. Just, you know, just give us a little bit more an easy version of an Ethiopian situation. Um, what monitoring may look like um, uh, in terms of, you know, can you have an ultrasound? Can you see the IVC, the central veins and see monitor about volume star, you know, those kind of things and maybe airlines. And then the second thing is if you can elaborate about the continuous replacement, uh, you know, renal replacement therapy, because I'm not sure if uh, a lot of people are familiar with that. So if you can elaborate on both, and then uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Theodros is uh, online, but I would really love to hear his voice. And um, if he has some comments or questions, I'll give the floor next to him. So Elias, could you comment on those two issues first? Oh, okay, Gilma, yeah, that, uh, I can. That's a great question, actually. So. Since we don't use a pulmonary catheter um, or swan guns anymore, so what we use is bedside ultrasound. So you, there are a couple of things you can easily do. So for example, leg raising uh, that to see if your patient's gonna be fluid responsive, right? If you do, when you do a bedside ultrasound, you can see the IVC size, if they are mechanically vented, whether they have respiratory variation or not. And, and also just have gross idea of your uh, left ventricle, whether it's hyperdynamic or not. And then sometimes you don't need to be uh, echocardiography expert to see that, whether your left ventricle is filled or not, right? In, in septic shocks, usually sometimes your left ventricle is empty. It's what we call a kissing ventricle. So you can see that and you know, you know that, I mean, this, this patient doesn't need a preload, right? Fluid. And uh, if IVC is engorged, uh, usually more than two centimeters, that what we here measure, uh, and does not has no respiratory variation, then you, you, your you, your fluid probably won't work because it's not the fluid issue. Uh, those are easy to do actually, and uh, and at the same time you can also while you're there you can look at your your lung, obviously so the B lines for example. When the, it's not very uh, specific to fluid, but you, if you do multiple ultrasounds of the lung, you can see if your lung is congested, has severe pulmonary edema. Maybe that's where the, to stop the resuscitation because then if you, you're leading your patient to more respiratory distress, other than your clinical examination. So bedside ultrasound actually used well can give you a lot of information. So there are a lot of uh, uh, YouTube lectures, any then ICU, uh, guys can look at, uh, there's a beautiful New England uh, uh, medicine uh, ultrasound, basic ultrasound lessons you can look at. And I know there is, the ultrasounds are accessible in Ethiopia, I, I, uh, if I'm correct. So using ultrasound is very important and we do use them. Uh, sometimes I do round with ultrasound. So I know my colleagues do as well. So, uh, so you can get a lot of information from that. Now arterial line, you mentioned arterial line. The problem with that is the monitoring. I don't know whether we have capability of monitoring, but uh, other monitoring you can hook up with the arterial line and use them, as well as with the central uh, venous axis. But that's a little sophisticated, uh, and uh, and it's a little more expensive too, and it does uh, require a lot of intensive nursing monitoring as well. 
But the ultrasound idea is, I think, a great question. And I, I think you, you should probably be use, using a lot of ultrasound if you can. Could you uh, talk about uh, the dialysis piece? Oh, that's, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So the, there was also a question from one of the audience members that said, you know, you know, when you, if you do dialysis, do you need to have a, a dedicated separate dialysis machine? Or so you can elaborate if they need hemodialysis, you know, how do they do that? And also please uh, say a few more explanation on the continuous renal replacement therapy. So, so yeah. So, so, so continuous renal replacement therapy is essentially, because there are essentially three kinds of modalities. There's called intermittent hemodialysis that you do three times a week. You take large volume but in short hours where the hemodynamics, especially if the blood pressure is stable, they can tolerate that and you, you do that three times a week. Now, TRRT or CVVHD, they call it, is, is you take small amount, about 50 TC an hour, uh, anywhere from there, but over 24 hours continuous, because then you don't affect the hemodynamics, because they can tolerate it. Uh, and it, at the same time, you, you'll be able to uh, clean out their either volume or, or toxin uh, eradication, right? That, and so now the problem with that is, like your questioner uh, pointed out, it is labor intensive. You need to have one dedicated nurse for that patient. Not only that, your dialysis machine is tied to that patient for a long time. So that is the disadvantage. Now there is a, one in between your nephrologist can help you. You can do what, what they call it the intermediate, like instead of uh, 24 hours, you might just do it in eight hours. Still they can tolerate it and still use that dialysis for two or three more patients instead of uh, uh, tying it to one patient. So that, that some places even here, they do that. And uh, in Ethiopia, I'm sure they should be able to do that. And patients to tend to tolerate, well, and the outcome seems to be the same, whether you use a, but continuous renal replacement therapy, again, is because it's, they can tolerate it well, um, and it doesn't affect their hemodynamics uh, more. Um, yeah, so that's essentially the difference. So there are there are a few other questions, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Teodros probably uh, might have left. I think he has also a concurrent meeting that happens at four o'clock uh, Ethiopian time. So I'm sorry that uh, we are really short on time and we didn't hear his voice. Uh, but that said, um, um, can you uh, mention on what is your hemoglobin target in terms of uh, when do you transfuse, and also. Another question is, you know, how is the blood bank supply? Are there any additional measures that people are taking for, you know, blood donation perspective in uh, this uh, uh, era of uh, pandemics? Oh yeah, that's a great question. As you, Irma, you know as well. I mean, blood blood donation has gone down significantly even in here. So there's a lot of campaign about people. Uh, giving blood because they are scared and they stay in home, and so that is and that's going to be an issue in Ethiopia as well. So, but hemoglobin target is a great one. So there is a, a lot, a lot of data actually, right? Well, restrictive transfusion criteria, what we call it. We, so right now, hemoglobin above seven, we uh, six point nine actually that what we use in, in my facility, and that is the data backs that up to. Uh, uh, you don't need to transfuse them more than that in any kind of situation. Other than again, there are exceptions. So we're talking about we're not talking about trauma or acute bleeding. So we, we're talking about the, the sepsis in shock or in any kind of failure. Now, in active cardiac ischemia, the, that is a different issue, right? The, number one, the data did not include people with acute uh, active cardiac ischemia, so. Uh, but still, uh, it's uh, essentially physician dependent. You know, the cardiologist uh, likes to get their uh, MI patients hemoglobin higher, uh, 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 higher, you know, they, they pull out of the air. Uh, no more 10 though. So we used to target 10, that is the, uh, uh, no more the case, but seven is uh, the criteria anyway. Seven or less, unless you have active bleeding, uh, 
we don't target above seven. And if you do actually, as you, Kirma, you know, there is a quality measure. So you actually get a call if you transfuse above seven and you have to explain why. So. Yeah, and um, um, Daoud, I see you are on and um, can you just um, maybe chime in about um, the labs these days in the hospitals that handle COVID uh, patient related uh, workup, uh, be it bacteriology or serology or whatnot, are those labs separate or is it the same lab that's using just uh, the universal precautions? Yeah, in our place, uh, I have to look and uh, get back to you probably if we have uh, a session tomorrow. But uh, in our place, it's the same lab. Uh, we haven't separated it. Uh, as, as you know, uh, in terms of risk of infection and in this uh, disease, uh, it's not much higher than any other thing because these are specimens that has been very well designated. They're uh, nasopharyngeal swabs and uh, blood specimen, what uh, have you. But uh, uh, yes, they are doing them in the same lab, uh, but with a very uh, uh, strict infectious infection prevention guidelines and uh, PPEs. Um, so as a vascular surgeon, I have to ask this question, Elias. I mean, you do not mention antiplatelet agents in these people who have, you know, thrombotic complications. And, and so, <laughs> I mean, heparin is not everything, you know. So we, so do you give them antiplatelets, you know, be it aspirin or others, or is that not proven yet? So now, data-wise, uh, there is no data that I'm aware. But uh, we do continue our patients' antiplatelet agent for the reason I just mentioned, because these patients are hypercoagulable, and mm -hmm. they, and, and most of them have already underlying diabetes and cardiovascular disorders. And they usually come with uh, um, aspirin and Plavix. So we do continue. The other thing we do continue is if they are on a Coumadin or any oral anticoagulating agents, we actually continue them because, because those are patients at high risk of uh, uh, thrombosis. Uh, so yes, we do. Uh, but it, I don't know of any data though, to be honest. So, so there's one question that comes up again, and again uh, every day uh, when we have the sessions, which is, you know, you know, how long should a physician or a nurse or a healthcare professional work uh, continuously in a COVID unit? A uh, question comes up, and you know, uh, Elias, you can share your experience, but I can also tell you uh, that uh, how we have set it up in our in our system is uh, we have a team that stays uh, 12 hours a day in the, during the day and 12 hours at night. Um, and it goes for five days continuously. And in other places, I think it goes for seven days continuously. So that's how um, most organizations have organized to, uh, number one, limit the number of people who go in and out. Uh, and also at the same time, um, conserve your uh, protection uh, materials, if you will. Um, and, uh, and so, I, you know, I don't know, Elias, if, uh, from your experience, uh, are there any strict rules about how many hours people are um, engaged in those units? And um, how do you do it at your place? Um, so that would you uh, said it. I think excellent yesterday. He did give uh, some gui guidance uh, what the ETFN should do. I think he, he came up with five days. Uh, if I remember, Dowd is here, so he, he can, can tell you again. So and it, uh, I think that, that that's probably a great uh, suggestion. Uh, and again, like you said here, our shifts are already organized like that. So my shift is, a, as you know, is seven days on, seven days off. So, uh, so when I'm on, I'm on. And, uh, what, what some of the things you can do if you, uh, when you deal with COVID, like I do, as you know, Gurma, is yeah, if you want, I think the, the, I guess the fear is to protect your family, right? So from, from bringing this COVID to them. So you probably can self-isolate yourself in the basement like I'm doing right now. So, and uh, when, if you get to see them, you just have to keep your social distancing uh, or wear a mask. Like once in a while, sometimes I do. 
uh, um, so you can, you probably should have to come up with your, your own way. But in general, though, shift shift the quoting uh, is probably the best way you can you can do. Uh, like uh, Dr. Dow did suggest, and you just suggested so to avoid uh, 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 that act is contaminating your family. Without any future. Gerba, I also uh, know our, our system. I heard you also suggesting ours is five days on and five days off. On that five day when you are on call, uh, if you are a person, a medical professional who is involved with known COVID or suspected COVID, uh, the hospital is actually offering a hotel. Uh, uh, with a shuttle uh, back and forth and you can quarantine there yourself for that five day i mean the, the risk is after five days of course you have another 14 days to quarantine yourself but if you don't have any symptoms at least you can do the quarantine at home that's uh, the whole purpose in ethiopia if uh, at the early days uh, you can do that but if the epidemics really hits us really hard i think my suggestion uh, is uh, and uh, I wanted to hear from Mondosan and uh, Tedros also if they are uh, uh, two weeks at a time would be an ideal one uh, two weeks on and two weeks off and probably if the uh, PPE issue is really uh, the scarcity is uh, as it is right now I probably would stay in, in an area because Ethiopian government is actually looking uh, uh, seriously about places uh, to for health professionals to stay and also transportation system. Yeah, I don't know if um, Dr. Wondosan is on, and I know both of them have um, some conflict in terms of meetings uh, this, uh, the afternoons after four. Um, you know, we're getting close to the end of our um, uh, question and answer session. So with that, I will um, uh, let you be, and thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow at the same time so thank you, Malakwa. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Elias.